Amen to that indeed. Thank you, Carr. We appreciate your ministry. We certainly have a reason to sing this morning as we reflect on the author and finisher of our faith. We have gathered together this morning ultimately to exalt him and him alone. We are so glad that each of you are here. We once again have been graced with very special uh, guests and visitors. Thank you for being with us today, uh, including my personal physician, uh, Doc Fraley, who doctors me all the way from Texas. Uh, so good to have uh, Doc and Nellie and I believe their sons uh, with them uh, today and with us, and uh, we certainly rejoice over that, and we're glad again that each of you are here. I want to note with you so that you can be praying for our day camp ministry. It begins tomorrow morning, and so please be indulgent in prayer in regard to that, and also in regard to our day camp ministry, all Workers, you'll be meeting immediately after the morning worship service this morning in the wing uh, for a relatively short meeting, so please make note of that and make that a part of your plans today. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 5. We're reading once again verses 21 through 24. Genesis chapter 5, beginning with verse 21 and reading through the 24th verse. As you find it in the first book of the Bible, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Thank you. you. May be seated for our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you again today as the choir has reminded us you have put a song in our hearts and the reason why you have. And by the way, God, we recognize that the song is there regardless of the trials and tribulations and troubles of life. And we're glad for that. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The choir has reminded us that we do indeed have a song in our hearts and it reflects on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one and only Savior. Part of our prayer this morning is for those who have not yet put their personal faith and trust in Christ. I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Then they too can join us with a very special and wonderful and miraculous song in their heart. Lord, we thank you for not only saving us, but also for the way that you continue to work in our lives day by day and moment by moment. We certainly pause to thank you again for the inscripturated word of God, and part of our heart cry is that we would be eternally impacted by its truth even this hour. We certainly are careful to be praying for our day camp ministry as it begins tomorrow morning and runs for the next three days. God, I pray that your hand of blessing would be upon that ministry in a very special way. I pray that uh, the, the goodly number of children would be uh, greatly impacted by uh, the truth of your word and this wonderful time of fellowship that they will have at the camp. Lord, uh, we commit ourselves to you this hour. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you in many different ways, including our giving. May you be pleased with us as we go about your business today, we pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. <laughs>
God, I stand. Beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you. Well, let's stand once again, singing 637 in our hymnals. Now I belong to Jesus, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. 637, now I belong to Jesus.
just like a soldier take back what's been stolen and fight like a man holding all fathers run to your children we fall in a strength in the name of Jesus, calling all fathers, wake up. Our sons we know, we see the men deep inside of them. Our daughters need Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate that. What a challenging song that is, and know oh, how it jives with God's message to us this morning in such a direct way. In fact, uh, with our reflecting on the words of the song, uh, it really helps us to begin to measure some of the cost of your and my not walking with God. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, you certainly have set things up for us. We are reflecting once again on the amazing ministry of the Holy Spirit of God who literally orchestrates God's things for us. We've just listened to the words of a a very pointed song. And uh, if we did listen, then it, it did indeed stir our hearts. There's a lot at stake. Lord, with us uh, choosing uh, to live an apathetic Christian life, to be living in our carnality. And as uh, the young men have challenged us, it certainly is time for us to wake up from our spiritual lethargy. And one of the ways in which we can do that is by embracing your teachings that we are hovering over here in Genesis 5. And this amazing statement that Enoch walked with God. Help us first to understand and see, and then to embrace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in Genesis has brought us face to face with the Old Testament patriarch Enoch. And although, and we've noted this many times already, although not, A whole lot is said of him. What is said is very, very 
significant, including the statement that is made two times over in our text, Genesis 5, first of all in verse 22a, and then again in verse 24a, Enoch walked with God. We have posed two questions. One, what exactly does it mean to walk with God? And two, am I, are you? We have noted that although a book could be written in answer to the question, what does it mean to walk with God? I am offering four succinct things. We said walking with God um, may involve more than these four things, but certainly not less. We have picked up the first two. I rehearse that with you very quickly. One, walking with God means that there is no part in your life, no arena or aspect of your life where God and the things of God doesn't come into play, doesn't hold sway. Uh, this first thing is actually coming from uh, the semantics that we have in this phrase, this idea of walking with God. We noted that uh, we have a figurative use of the word walk and that uh, when you look at it here and the way that it's used throughout Scripture, you recognize that your walk is one and the same with your life. And so every aspect of our lives ought to be dominated by God and God's things. Two, to walk with God is to be in agreement with God. You'll recall that we cited uh, the rhetorical question the prophet Amos asks in 3.3 of his book. Can two walk together and not be agreed? We said it might help us to envision God inviting us to run a three-legged race with him. The man who walks with God agrees with God about everything. Everything that God is, everything that God says, everything that God does. Think about all the arguing that you and I do with God. Think about all of the bucking we do in regard to God and his dealings with us. Think about all of the times that we squeal like a stuck pig. Think about how often we are like Israel of old, murmuring and disputing. Listen, the man, the woman, the young person who is walking with God simply does not do that. This morning we pick up the final two things, so here we go, number three. To walk with God is to walk in God's way, and to walk in God's way is to walk in God's word. You probably want me to say that one more time. To, no, apparently you don't, but I'm still going to say it anyways. To walk with God is to walk in God's way, and to walk in God's way is to walk in God's word. You're not surprised by this, but the fact of the matter is we are in measure removed from this reality. I want you to listen. Normally you would turn with me, and we certainly will be doing some turning, but I, I want you to listen without turning to the first eight verses of blessed Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all of thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. <clears throat> Forgot to breathe. And I got my rock. The man who walks with God walks in God's way. And to walk in God's way is to walk in God's word. Folks, to walk with God is to strictly obey God's word. I'm telling you that we have strayed from this. I'm telling you that we have bought into 
the false philosophy that you and I need to be so very concerned about being fanatical. You and I need to be so very concerned about being legalistic. You and I need to be so very concerned about formalism. And listen, these are grave matters, and we indeed do need to be concerned. But I'm thinking that you and I, from a practical standpoint, are so far removed from those things that we really don't have to worry about it. We do need to worry about is whether or not we are with explicitly obeying God. Whether or not we're like what we used to be when we were children and said, God said it, I believe it, that's good enough for me. I'm going to trust and obey. God's telling me what he desires for me to do and I, with his help, am going to do it. Who would have ever guessed? We think that walking with God is going to be some kind of complicated and, and, and mysterious thing when in reality when you look at the heart of it we're coming back to those things that are fundamental and foundational to Christian life and living like obeying. Fact of the matter is we, many of God's people, most of God's people are simply forgetting to obey. And again, it's so sad to me that we would say, well, ah, you can't be too passionate about such things. Again, you're going to become legalistic and formalistic. No, this is life. The word of God are the words of life. And this is love. I remind you that your Savior, Christ, crucified, buried, risen, and coming again, said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's a matter of love. It's not a matter of legalism. It's not a matter of fanaticism. It's not a matter of formalism. It's a matter of love. Do you love your Savior? And if we do, then we, like David, will be passionate about the Word of God. I think I triggered your thinking in this realm last week. I I, I cited with you that you and I ought to remember, I, I guess I said it this way, re, remember when you and I were first saved. You, you said with passion, God, remember, he just saved you. Remember you were on the road to eternal loss and ruin. Listen, if you're here this morning and you have not put your faith and trust in Christ, I am reaffirming again today something that you've probably heard before, but it's the most important decision in all of life. You and I, because of our sin, we all are sinners, Romans 3.23, fall way short of the glory of God. Isaiah the prophet says in 59 and 2 of his book, our sin separates us from God. That's the reality. And that separation not only in, uh, in includes this life, this earthly sojourn of ours, but worse, the life to come. You and I were on the road to eternal loss and ruin, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. We were condemned in our sins. We were in a peck of trouble. And there was no hope. Not on the human plane, there was no hope. No one could rescue you on the human plane because they have the very same problem you have, sin. We've all rebelled. We've all turned our backs on God. All, we like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, Isaiah 53, 6. God loved us so much that he sent his Son and the Lord Jesus Christ who would become the one and only Savior. Oh, he was that before the foundations of the world, but in point in time, from a historical standpoint, there would be a point in time in space, matter, and time when he would mount Calvary and literally bear the penalty of the sins of the whole wide world so that any man, woman, or young person who would simply turn from their sin and embrace his sacrifice than the one who gave it, that they'd be wonderfully and miraculously saved, the sins forgiven, heaven, their eternal home. You and I were on the road to eternal loss and ruin. Then came Jesus. And you embraced him. And he absolutely transformed your life. And the very moment he did that, you said, God, you show me your plan for my life. Because I will do it. With your help, I will do it. 
You remember singing, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountains or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. I'm telling you this, the man who's walking with God, he's never stopped singing. The man who is walking with God has never stopped reflecting, never stopped being motivated by all that Christ has done, is doing, and will do in his life. The man, the woman, the young person who is walking with God continues to seek God hard in regard to the plan of God. Not just all of those things that are laid out word by word in in, in the inscripturated word of God, but also the will of God and the specialized and unique and personalized plan of God reflecting on the principles of the word of God that is unique to you. The man, the woman, the young person of God every single time that you turn around, you find him asking God, what is your plan for my life? Because with your help, I will do it. Nothing takes precedence over his obeying what God has said in his word. That kind of obedience. Where you come in contact with the man who's walking with God and you are impressed with one thing, nothing more important to him than obeying God. So are you and am I walking with God? Four, walking with God <clears throat> implies deep, and again, this will be no surprise to you, walking with God implies deep, intimate communion and fellowship where you and God are consistently communing, constantly talking. Now you say, Pastor Tom, well, that sounds like a reemphasis on the word of God, and I say, yes, in fact, you won't find anything that's severed from what you know be, to, to be true in the word of God with any of these four things. But, but listen, since we've especially already emphasized, since with number three we have emphasized the import of the word of God, let's let this fourth thing be an emphasis on not God talking to us through his word, but our talking to God through the wonderful medium of prayer. The man, the woman, the young person who walks with God is marked by prayer. You would say, that's a man of prayer. You would hear this person's name and your response would be, that's a man of prayer. You would hear this woman's name and you would say, that's a woman of prayer. You would hear this young person's name. Wouldn't that be awesome if that was the case? You would hear this young person's name and and you'd just say, man, that's a young person, even in spite of their age, that is just constantly talking to God. The man, the woman, the young person who is walking with God is marked by prayer. Consistently talking to God. By the way, and you've heard this a zillion times, that's a little bit of hype. Herbalytic speech. That the basis of any personal relationship is a constant flow of two way communication. Even us old timers that have been buried for 50 or 60 years, and you know, there's jokes about how we go to a restaurant and we don't talk to each other, but really we do. We, it's mainly with body language and grunts and moans and groans and sighs. But boy, boy, we're we're doing an awful lot of communicating. Basis of any personal relationship is a constant flow of two-way communication where God talks to you again through his word and where you talk to God through the wonderful medium of prayer. The man who is walking with God is marked by prayer. He's constantly talking to God and he prays to God and, and talks to God about everything he actually embraces and 
allows it to govern his life versus like Philippians 4, 6 that says, that says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. He actually believes that. What a fool. He actually thinks that he ought to be communing with God, really communing his way, communing with God his way through the day. He actually believes that there's nothing too trivial that he can't talk to God about. He actually invites God along with him as if that was necessary. But again, that I guess it is necessary for his own heart and mind. He invites God along with him through the course of his day. Something very closely related to this that we used to emphasize a long time in the good old days and not so much anymore, is, is he actually practices the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get the feeling that as the man lives his day, as the woman lives out her day, as the young person conducts himself through the course of the day, you get the impression that they actually believe that Christ is with them. And they function with a view to that. It isn't like what most of God's people do where we, you know, in times of trouble we revel in the promise of God that Christ will never leave us nor forsake us. And listen, that is a wonderful promise and it is absolutely crucial that we continue to embrace it. But they're not saving the Lord Jesus Christ just for those difficult times in life. But rather that they have, actually have a practical relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're walking with them. <laughs> they're walking with the Lord. He's a part of everything that unfolds through the course of their day. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul said something, and I, I, I want to pursue this with you. I'll show you once again my uh, simplicity. This certainly relates to what we read, and it'll be a joy to get to this in our Sunday evening study, but I'll uh, prep you for that even now. By the way, it'll be a while since we get to it in our Sunday evening study. We're studying through on Sunday evening for Thessalonians. It's an awesome study. When we get to chapter 5 and verse 17, probably three years from now, <laughs> we'll read this command. Pray without ceasing. I want to share something with you, and again, I, I'm certainly not being smarty aleck, and I'm the first to recognize that I'm just a peon, and first to recognize that I have a very simple mind. It's part of the problem. I mean, not that we have any major problems, by the way. It sure is great loving and serving the Lord together and all. But, you, you know, if you ever feel like, oh, that past time, I'm running way ahead of him, well, hey, you know, just wait a little bit, and I'll catch up. I've had a problem, this goes all the way back to being a young person, I've had a problem with this verse, pray without ceasing and the normal interpretation of it. Again, I'm not being critical, I'm just sharing with you my heart. Uh, and, and I'm reflecting on you know, terminology that I've even used, so again, I'm not being critical. I have a lot of good commentators, uh, I guess I shouldn't say a lot, I, I, have, a, I have a decent number of good commentaries. I, I consulted them again this week in regard to this principle. It, it's actually a command, pray without ceasing. And every one of them said what we normally say. Because the, the normal interpretation goes like this. There, there's no way that we can just be constantly praying, right? I mean, you, you and I really, if all we did was pray, if all we were doing was praying and we didn't engage in any of the other things that Christ has commissioned us to do, then, you, you know, again, we, we would be of little value. So we say it like this, there's no way that God can be telling us that we just need to be constantly praying. And so the normal interpretation is that we ought to be in the spirit of prayer. How many have heard that? How, how many of us have said that? I have. What in the world does that mean? To be in the spirit of prayer. Well, if you press somebody about that, it's, it's like, well, at any time you're ready to pray. So, at any time, you're ready to pray. Be careful, I, I might pray. At any time, I might pray. 
And of course, we could live our entire day being ready to pray and having not once prayed. I'd be very careful, and again, I'm recognizing I'm a simple-minded man. Still don't understand it. What in the world does it mean to be in the spirit of prayer? Oh, don't misunderstand. We ought to be living lives that are conducive to prayer. We ought to be ready at any turn to pray. I understand that. But we're missing the fact that when Paul records this, and there's only two words in the original language, the word pray, it's in the imperative mood. And, and the imperative mood is the mood of command. There's no mention of the spirit of prayer. God, through the Apostle Paul, says pray. 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 It's in the imperative mode. And then this modifier, without ceasing. Well, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? Very best explanation I have. I wasn't going to say all this to you, but I am. The very best explanation that I've come across reflects on the Greek culture. Remember, as Paul writes in the first century, that um, he, even though uh, the Roman Empire is alive and well, per se, r remember that, that the world has been Hellenized. Remember that the New Testament was written in the Greek language. Remember that culture had a Greek tone to it. And the very best explanation I've ever heard about what does it mean to pray without ceasing, where it honors the command, where you're actually praying, you're praying, 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 the very best explanation is a reflection on the Greek culture. People loved going to the Greek plays. That's yay or nay, I'll leave that for you. Pe people loved going to the Greek plays. And when you went to a good play, and we can relate to this with some of our activities, people loved the Greek plays. They would go to the Greek play, and of course there would be intermissions through different sets and scenes. And when the play was really good, they didn't want a long intermission, if you know what I mean. They were ready to get going to scene number two, three, four, however it might be. So they coined a word, it's a single word in the Greek, that represented their desire for a short intermission. And it's the Greek word that Paul uses here with the command pray. Pray, pray, pray. Make sure that there's not long intermissions between your times of prayer. Or to state it positively, make sure that there's only short intermissions between your time of prayer. I don't know about you, and again, you guys are better thinkers and more sophisticated and certainly more intellectual than me, but I'll take that over having a spirit of prayer where we never really get around to actually praying. Boy, there's a day for you. The man, the woman, the young person gets up in the morning and one of the first things that they do is they listen to God, they get their marching orders and one of the first things they do is that they talk to God again, this personal relationship with him. But God knows this about the man who walks with him, that there's not going to be a long intermission before he's talking again. He might have the spirit of, you know, I'll give him the spirit of prayer, but he doesn't go long before he's actually praying. And because God is the priority to him, he talks to God about everything. You know, this is interesting, and forgive me. Well, no, I'm, I'm not asking for forgiveness. It, it is a practical application for, for what it's worth. Again, we know that it's dangerous for us to talk to God only when we're in trouble. But I'll tell you, if we talked to God only when we were in trouble, our prayer life would really go through the ceiling. Isn't that something? There, there's a little bit of sadness and gladness in this. If you and I would just talk to God each and every time we are in some kind of trouble, we'd be praying a lot more than what we do now. That's why I love, you know, we have some interesting prayer requests or interesting testimonies in regard to prayer and answer to prayer, but that's, that, that's why I love it when a you know, when a rough and tumble man says, boy, I was working on this machinery and I dropped a bolt and I couldn't find it and I prayed and asked God to help me to find that bolt and I found it. Whew, I scared myself on that. 
oh, you talk to God about missing bolts. Yes, I do. Why do you do that? Because I talk to God about everything. How often do you talk to God? Oh, time after time after time through the course of the day. In fact, I'd say it like this. There's only a short intermission between my times of prayer. My heart cries to God. Because, I mean, at every turn. You, you know, that's true in the workplace. It's too, true in the school. School room, we, we, we talked about what if you talk to God every time you're in trouble? What if you talk to God every time you face some kind of challenge? Wow. And then what if you and I were obedient to the high calling of Christ on our lives to be thankful for everything? What if our hearts really were full of praise and thanksgiving? What if, what if it was an ongoing song issuing from our hearts? Well, boy, we'd be praying all the time. There would be short intermissions between our times of talking to God. So question, are you walking with God? One, does God and the things of God come into play and hold sway in every arena and area of your life? Two, do you agree with God about everything? Three, are you walking in obedience to God's word? Four, are you consistently, constantly communing and fellowshipping with God? A final statement and a final question. Statement. You and I can walk with God. It's possible. We once again are hitting up against something that we know, practically speaking, is extraordinary. Where when you come across a man, a woman, a young person who is truly walking with God, you say that is the exception to the rule. While the Holy Spirit of God is knocking on the fleshly tablets of our hearts and saying what you view as being extraordinary ought to be the norm. We ought to be walking with God. There ought to be many Enochs. And by the way, we're not done with Enoch. And next week, you'll see some of the mechanics of these four things in Enoch's life. I can't wait. We all ought to be like Enoch. Statement, you and I can walk with God and question Sort of an, I hate to use the word, but sort of an evolution in our question. We, we, we start out by asking ourselves the, the question, um, am I? We've been asking it through the course of these four things. We've listed them, a thing, and then we've said with a view to that, am I walking with God? I think the question becomes, do you want to? It's actually an invitation. It's reflecting on these four things. It's recognizing along with Pastor Tom that we have some work to do, if you know what I mean. And the question becomes, do we want to? Do we want to walk with God? And I'm asking you, I'm not making a big show of this, but I, I'm asking you to join me. I believe your heart is the same as mine. I want to walk with God. I absolutely want these four things to be practically true in my life. So would you communicate that desire to God in prayer even now? As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, a closing word to the unsaved. Those who are here today are within the sound of this voice who have not yet put personal faith and trust in Christ. I, I need to notice with you, it's not a warning, I guess, it's just a closing word. You can't walk with God apart from knowing him. You can't walk with God apart from having a relationship with him. The whole thing, and we stress that, is based upon relationship, where you know him. Oh, he knows you through and through, but where you know him intimately and personally. We're back to recognizing a fundamental biblical truth, and that is our sin prevents us from knowing God. 
Again, it separates us from God very effectively. The way that we come to know God, the way that we begin a relationship with God is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question for you is, has, has there been a point in time in your life when you saw your need of Christ because of your sin and you prayed to receive him as your own personal savior? Because I'll tell you this, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, your walk, your potentially, well, your walk with God begins. You can't walk with God apart from knowing God, and you can't know God apart from knowing his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you have not put your faith and trust in Christ, I would plead with you to do it even now in the quietness of this moment. And, and please let somebody know of this all-important decision. Heavenly Father, we thank you. It's been a joy and privilege to be in the house of God again this morning and to pursue with you this idea of what it means to walk with God. Certainly we would pray again for those who are here who have not put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior. We would pray for their salvation and that they wouldn't leave this place apart from being assured of that. But you, for two sessions plus have been challenging the hearts and minds of those who already know you. And you've given us four things to contemplate. I, I, I think they're four measuring sticks that we can use to hold up to our lives to determine whether or not we're actually walking with God. And then based upon what we have seen and based upon what the Holy Spirit of God has already done in our hearts, we desire to communicate to our hearts desire to walk with you. So help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We love him because he first loved us. And if we love him, we will obey him. We will walk in his commands. Let's sing a song that expresses our desire of love for him. Standing and closing with 456, My Jesus, I love thee. After which our brother Tom Schmidt will close us in prayer. Standing together, 456, verse 1. Dear Lord, I just thank you uh, for this challenge today uh, to walk with God more and to, to seek you. And Lord, I just thank you for the challenge that to strengthen our prayer life and to always be seeking to have shorter in intermissions in between our prayers and uh, have a desire to, to seek you always. Lord, I thank you for bringing us here and I just ask that you would can, you would help us to, to follow through on this commission that our pastor has uh, given us. Thank you for all that you do, God, in, in our lives and blessing us and bringing us to where we need to be. Uh, guide us as we go from here and keep us safe according to your will. And thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.